Good morning, Calvary Church. How are you? Thank you. I like participation, so that's a good sign that you're ready to participate with me this morning. I have been privileged to be in your first service and your second service, and wow, the worship service is God not present here today. It is so obvious and so uh, apparent to me that this church focuses on who Jesus is, what Jesus does, and sharing Jesus with others by just being in your building this morning. I know much more about Calvary Church because you have been a central drop-off location for Operation Christmas Child for several years. Bobby and Pam serve in on our area team. They're local volunteers who serve in our area, serve in your area that includes all the Mid-Atlantic South. We, we, I just wanna thank you from OCC for sharing them with us. They are a great team that work together. Bobby is in charge of our, all of our logistics for uh, this area. That includes 20,000 shoeboxes, over 20,000 collected last year in this area. That's his role. So when you see him say thank you, because each one of those 20,000 shoebox represents a child that not only received a gift, but they get to hear the gospel of Jesus as they received a gift. So I'm very excited to, uh, to be here this morning. This, uh, the first service went very well. They didn't kick me out, so I'm back. Um, it's a great thing to be. But before I do anything, I believe in opening God's word and sharing some with you. So I'm going to be in the last chapter of Matthew, Matthew 28. I'm going to read verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came near to them and said to them, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. You see, OCC, Operation Christmas Child, this church partners with us in going and telling baptizing believers and discipling them so that they know how to share Jesus with others. That is who we are and that's what we do. But before I say any more, I wanna just give this time over to God, so let's pray. Father God, I thank you for this church and how committed they are to serve you with all of who they are. This morning, I ask that they hear your voice and your stories and your goodness through what I say. Let them not hear me, but hear you, Jesus because you are so powerful and so loving and you allow us to be used to spread your gospel around the world. Thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for being the God of glory and the God of grace and it's in your powerful name we pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. See, Operation Christmas Child has three main objectives. We believe in evangelism, we believe in discipleship, and we believe in multiplication. So we have three things. We have... Good, good, okay, let's try that again. We have, we have, and we have evangelism, who Jesus is, uh, who he is, discipleship, what Jesus taught us and what we should share with others, and multiplication, how to take that knowledge of the gospel and share it with those around us that go, that go. See, that go is not just uh, over there, but that go is to your neighbor. That go is to the people who walk in the front door who don't know you. If you're visiting the first time, so am I. This is exciting. We're here together. But this is a church that's going to love on you and it's going to teach you about who Jesus is. But that go is everywhere. That go is everywhere you go. And so that sharing the gospel, that multiplication is sharing the gospel. And you do that when you pack a simple gift. When you pack those shoe boxes and you put uh, soap and you put uh, toothbrushes, not toothpaste, that you put uh, notebooks and doll babies and slingshots and lots of other things in those shoe boxes so that the children open them. That's amazing gift. They love that. But what they lo- we love even more is they get to experience a relationship with Jesus if they choose to follow. Some have never heard the gospel before. They're hearing it for the first time through your obedience of packing shoeboxes, through your giving, your praying over that shoebox, they're receiving the gospel overseas. See, people ask us all the time, where do these shoeboxes go and how do they get there? 
So we have local teams like Bobby and Pam are on the Central Del Mar team. If you're interested in hearing more, I'm sure they'd love to tell you how to join that team. They have specific roles. They have specific jobs that they do. So not everyone is doing everything. We have different roles here because they live where? Here. I do not live here anymore. I live in Howard County, Maryland, so I can't be here. And I have area teams, my, the whole, I have all of Maryland, all of Delaware, and parts of Virginia. I can't live everywhere. But our local volunteers serve where they live. See, the, 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 the same is true overseas. We are going to step in. Our national leadership teams are volunteers. They have given up their time and their energy and their talents to serve people overseas. See, the, I was in Tanzania, and this is a picture of the national leadership team in Tanzania, and these are some of the roles that they play. See, they, they know they're getting X number of shoeboxes at the end of National Collection Week. They start to hear how many they're going to get. They begin praying over which church, in which village, which pastor, which orphanage, to then hand the shoeboxes out. Because we have not reached in any country, we have not gotten to the point in any country that all the children have received the gospel message and received a gift. So they agonize over that. They agonize, the, the ministry partners, they agonize over who to invite. I heard in the announcements, Miss Dorothy talked about how your harvest party was moved to a different place. Suppose you had to write down the names of the kids that were coming to your harvest party six months ago, and only those could come. That's what our national ministry partners, that's what they have to do. They submit names six months in advance in order to receive shoeboxes with those children in front of them. No substitutions, no exchanges. That's how much they covet our prayers. They call us their superheroes because we are giving them keys to get into communities, to get into villages, to get into towns that no one has been able to share the gospel before. But there aren't many parents that would say no to a gift for their child. Right, parents? Would you do anything to get your child a gift, especially if you knew you couldn't give it to them? See, we were in Tanzania, and a, part, uh, a friend of mine was standing there, and a, a lady pushed her son in front of us in his best English. He said, thank you. And my friend kneeled down to him, and she was talking through the interpreter, and she said, this is just a simple gift, but we want you to know it's from Jesus and not us. The mother grabbed my friend's arm and through the interpreter said back, this is not a simple gift. This is extravagant. I could never provide this for my child, and Jesus did. Through your obedience of packing shoeboxes, that mother has, her son got an extravagant gift. But what's more important at that same event, at that very same event, they got to hear the gospel. And there were kids that stood up and said, I'm ready to follow, I'm ready to do that. And three of the boys that stood up were Muslim. They had heard the gospel for the very first time and God moved them in that event to receive Jesus. That's what your shoeboxes are doing. <laughs> Through your obedience on this side of the box and packing them. And, and I say that because we, it's, it's not hard. Who likes to shop? <laughs> Even if you don't like to, my mom hates to shop. She really hates to go to any store. She never wants, she just, she tells my sister to buy it for her. Um, she's 84, so we do anything mom wants. We always have, we're kind of scared of her. She's about this tall and she's very scary. <laughs> but you know what she says? She, do, she calls it, we have a build a box online. She doesn't like to go shopping, but in front of her, my sister sets it up and she puts soccer ball, pump, this, 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 boom. She's done. She can build a box online, she didn't have to shop. But we like to shop, we like to find things and it's a simple, simple thing to do to put it together. But I want you to know that the parents overseas, they receive it and it's extravagant. It's extravagant for them. See, these boxes, the 20,000 boxes that you received in this area last year through this location, 20,000, I wanna get that, that's a pretty big number. One in every 20 shoe boxes goes to an unreached people group. Now, unreached people groups are unreached because they're resistant to the gospel, they're in sensitive countries, or sometimes they're, they're uh, unreached just because they're too far away and we haven't gotten there yet. So unreached, so I gave you that, that broad overview, one in 20 in the last service, silly me, I'm a math teacher, and I was like, 
One in 20, how many is that? I'm like, dude, like over a thousand. I shamed myself being the math teacher. Like, over a thousand of shoeboxes that passed through here went to unreached people groups. No gospel. No gospel. A thousand of them from your location. See, I've never had to risk my life for the gospel. I may, may have been teased in college or I may have been teased by other people when I worked at different, why do you want Sundays off? Why do you do that church thing? Why? That, that's a little bit, but I have never put my life on the line for the gospel and I have lived in West Africa. I never felt that. But you see, these teams, these national leadership teams are trying to reach the unreached. In Tanzania, when I was there, they said there are 22 unreached people groups and they want that number to be zero and they're reducing the number every year of unreached people groups because of shoeboxes. See, there was a village, there was a, uh, the team said, this is whole area is Muslim, we're gonna go into this area. So they went to one village and the chief said no. Four villages later, one said yes. But they realized they couldn't drive through all the no's and safely get out. So what they did is they packed a canoe. They packed a canoe and in the dead of night, they get in the canoe and they paddled up to where that village was. At daybreak, the children came out. At dawn, they did the outreach event in a Muslim village and shared the gospel. That happens because you pack shoeboxes. See these men? literally put their life on the line. Didn't know if they were coming back. They're doing that and they thank us for the privilege of doing it because they would never have been able to do it without shoeboxes. A simple gift. That's extraordinary. People ask all the time, well, what, I have to say I suffered for Jesus. This was the hotel view I had for five days. <laughs> when I was in Tanzania, I know, I know. This does not even begin to explain the beauty of the people that were there. This is just God's handiwork. The people are so loving and so giving and they want to know things. They want to know how to do things. So these, I call these our ministry partners. So they are churches that have received the ability to have an outreach event. And so I had to take a picture of the first lady. She's wearing a Washington Nationals hat. Had she known she was prophesying the World Series victory? <laughs> but I thought, it's a local team. So she was so nervous. It was the first time that church got to have an outreach event. And she has in her hand what's called a ministry partner guide. I'm going to talk about those later. But I want you to remember that little magazine in her hand. It is a, she has been trained to share the gospel age appropriately with children in her language. That's in her language. I could not read it, it's in Swahili. So she is doing, and then, then the lady at the top, the little pictures that she has here in the booklet, we made them big, and so we have the posters. And then the bottom one, they haven't turned the posters around yet, so I saw like three different views of what's going on. But in each of these, the gospel is shared. In each of these, they understand that, that God made everything that we sinned, every one of us has sinned against God. But God didn't leave us there. He provided a way for us to know who he was. And that was because Jesus gives us the gift. We get up to that point, but then it's also we have to respond. Having the head knowledge is one thing. I can know all that. Satan knows that. The demons know that. But what happens when we respond? We are changed by God's word. That's what they do every outreach event. They're sharing the gospel. They do it at least two or three different ways so that the kid doesn't get it one way, he's gonna get it another way. That's what we're doing. Those shoe boxes are a do-good thing. It is a nice thing, but it is impacting the kingdom because the gospel does not go null and void into any area. So I wanna tell, tell you about my three little boys here. For some reason, I ended up in the boys section a lot in the outreach events, because you know you pack shoe boxes two to four, five to nine, 10 to 14, boys, girls. And that's how they seat them so it's easier to pass out the shoe boxes. So I ended up in the boy two to four section. Love little boys, somehow I'm a little boy magnet, just not a big boy magnet, so. <laughs> My little boys, so the, the one in the blue hat, he was about two years old. 
And not shortly after this picture was taken, he fell asleep on my right leg. So I picked him up and I put him on my shoulder, once again, using all my children's ministry skills. And then the other two, the one in the black and white sweatshirt and the plaid shirt, decided they were gonna wrestle the entire presentation. So here I am, like, wrestling with them and grabbing, and they set a special needs boy on a row, and they were trying to poke him, and I, you know, I'm ra- holding one sleeping and wrangling the other two. My teammates were behind me laughing, and they took this picture. Not this one, they took the next, there we go. They took this picture. If you can see my hand down here in the corner, see how it's holding on to that plaid shirt with dear, for dear life. See, during the gospel presentation, those posters were being presented, and they were being presented, and the, uh, every time they showed a poster, both boys would stop wrestling, poke me in the belly, and make me look. I'm like, I'm keenly aware of those. I made them. I've been trained in that, but they came to the one of Jesus on the cross, the poster of Jesus on the cross, and these two little boys stopped wrestling simultaneously, looked at, looked at the poster, and looked at me, and then this is what they said. This is exactly what they did. They both bowed their heads and went, Yesu. They understand what Jesus did for them because you packed a shoebox. Somebody was obedient enough to pack a shoebox. They were invited. They got to know what Jesus did for them on the cross at four years old. Did they make a decision that day? I don't know. But our job is not to do that part. Our job is to do our job and God will do his part. They, They got it. They understood. Here's what it looks like when you open shoe boxes. Once again, this is my cell phone, so it's not professional. This is raw, raw footage. All praise to him. I just got to witness it. But if you notice, see in his box, the picture, the little thing with the picture of Jesus on it, and on this next box, the little picture, that's called the greatest gift. That's 10 stories of Jesus. That's 10 stories of Jesus. They treat this as if these, this is what they came for, and the shoebox was extra. They hold onto those, they grip onto those, and they hold them so tightly. I have a friend and I've traveled with her a couple of times and when she was in an orphanage at her very lowest point, when she was 12 years old, she received a shoebox. She had read every fairy tale and she, had, she loved to read and anytime she could get her hand on her book, she would read it and she got that booklet in her language and she read it and she said, this can't be true. Her favorite fairy tale of all time was Cinderella because she was a nobody who became a somebody. She said she read that and she said this must be the biggest fairy tale of all because the king of kings wants me to be his daughter. She became a Christian. The very first time she ever read Jesus or knew of Jesus was that booklet. Now she speaks on behalf of Operation Christmas Child and tells her story of how when she was at her lowest point, God intervened and gave her hope in a time she had no hope. And she'll tell you, I was a nobody who became a daughter of the king through a booklet. We have all kind of kids. I'm telling you, it's just fun to see them. They put on whatever you give them. So the Santa hats were, it must have been a packing. I, I will never pack another shoebox without putting sunglasses in it. Because this happens every time they get sunglasses. They become Joe Cool. And this, this little boy, this is actually inside their church, center block walls, no windows, no doors, no concrete, just wooden, wooden benches. And yet he wore his very best to come to the presentation. And he actually received the very best. He got a soccer ball. He loved that. So I I show pictures of the boys and then uh, this is a picture of the girls. See how organized and how close to their city. I like to show the difference in the boys and and the girls are like, Love, and do you see the booklets holding on to them for dear life? They're not left behind. They're not left behind. So this little girl, I don't think she could put any more colors in the rainbow in her outfit that day. (laughs) 
And her dad was with her at the, you know, at the end they get to celebrate and their parents can then come. And, and so I asked the dad, I said, what's her name? And is she about three years old? Yeah, she's three. And I said, what's her favorite gift? And as he was about to ask her, she pulled the doll up in the air and held it way up in the air. That was her favorite thing in the shoe box. I couldn't, I couldn't do a presentation without Edna. I love, I love Edna. And oh, how they worship. Oh, how they worship. See, these girls, th- no shoe box had been handed out. All they knew they were coming and they might get something. They don't know what it is. They don't know what they're getting. These girls were sitting behind me. And so I took a anti-selfie, like missed me and got all of them. <laughs> they didn't know I was taking this picture. They were just worshiping as they were singing. And then we have some, some future worship leaders. The little girl in white, she's calling her friend because she didn't want to be alone. Come up, come on, come on. You'll see, he'll come and join who may direct the choir. With his lollipop. Who doesn't direct with their lollipop? This is a, a Sunday morning they have prepared a worship music for us. This is the one children's teacher for the church of 150 kids, leading them. There she is. See my little boys in the corner? Love to see them worship. Love to see them worship. Even more than singing, I love to see them dance. We don't dance near as well as they do. Nor did they let their shoeboxes out of their sight during the dance party. And this is my favorite. That little boy, yeah, (laughs) praise God. That little boy and his friends, I was sitting on the stage, it wasn't quite this high, so I could just sit, and they piled all their shoeboxes behind me. I guess they thought I could guard them all at one time. But then I stood up, and they all went and grabbed their shoeboxes, and so they danced with their shoeboxes. But he was wearing a pair of shoes, I don't know if you can recognize it, probably three or four sizes too big, the only shoes he probably had in his house but he didn't want to be left out and he wanted to wear his very best for the visitors and very best at the church. Love seeing them celebrate and, and learn about Jesus. In Tanzania, they didn't hide their special needs kids as many cultures do. The girl is, uh, she has Down syndrome and she uh, wanted us to come off the bus really bad. And I, my job is like, we have a protocol and how they, and it must have been they called the kids inside because she was like, peace, see you later. <laughs> But to see her in the front of the children's choir at that time, see her worship, see her sing, see her engage with her king, with her father, was amazing. The boy is the one that my guy was trying to poke the whole time, and this is his older brother and his caretaker. So he, didn't, he let him have like one little gift out of the box because he knew his brother would probably lose them and other kids would pick them up. So he protects him all the time. I love, can you not see the love on the older brother's face? celebrating with his, his brother that he got a gift. This lady, her son is somewhere on the autism scale and he was sitting with her and I said, can I take a picture? She just grabbed him and like pulled him in and I got the picture of the action of how many times has anyone ever celebrated her son? Now Jesus gave him a gift. Don't think that connected with them? Don't think that connected with them at all? More pictures of kids receiving gifts. We can just kind of go through some of these quicker. See their faces and, oh, okay. 
I tried to get a picture of the Ninja Turtle. <laughs> Once again, I'm a little boy magnet. All the little boys showed up. So I just thought, does that not show happiness? And this was before the gifts. We were just hanging out before the gifts. So a lot of people ask me uh, about Operation Christmas Child, and I do it for a living. And a few years ago, we raised the price uh, of the suggested donation from seven to nine dollars. Anybody remember that? Keep your hand up if you're excited about prices going up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Neither was my mom. So I went to go visit her right after we, we raised the, the price, and, and my mom came to me, and she said, uh, it was my birthday, and she had a little cupcake, and blew it out, it was late at night, and the next morning, I'm sitting at the, the kitchen table, and I'm, I'm eating breakfast in my jammies, and she goes, why'd you raise the price? Once again, a little scared of my mom. Mom, did you have a stroke? What are you talking about? Samaritan's Purse, they raised the price from seven to $9. I said, oh, yes, mom, like I had way above my pay grade, like I have any say in that kind of decision. But mom, I said, let me tell you what the $9 is for. See, Operation Christmas Child is forward thinking, not, not this year, but five years, 10 years, 20 years out. What is Operation Child gonna look like in 20 years? And we raised the price for a lot of reasons, but one of the main ones is we never wanted shoeboxes sitting in Charlotte that should be overseas. So we need, we need to have that, and, and we need to do that, and we need to make sure our ministry partners, our people overseas, they don't have to raise any money. So this money goes from the time a donor drops off a shoebox at a drop-off location to those church people that were sharing the gospel, they pick them up on their side. They don't have to raise any money. They used to have to raise money and get them out of customs and get them to, they don't, we now cover all of that with $9. She's like, okay, I said, mom, but let me tell you. See, have you ever taken your shoebox to a church and they put it in that cardboard box that says Samaritan's Purse beside it? Yeah, yeah, Connie, I've seen that. Your $9 paid for that. See, on this side of the shoebox, we're making an impact on, on our neighbors and our friends and our communities just up the road in, in Middletown. Anybody know where Middletown, Delaware is? Yeah, see, this, this crowd knows that. I can't do that everywhere. In Middletown, somebody got a box at Chick-fil-A and they dropped it off because it was a do-good thing. Oh, I'll help kids, I'll pack this. And they, they dropped it off at a drop-off location. And the next Sunday, the drop-off team leader whose face was just exhausted because she had collected all these shoeboxes, a visitor was walking in and she turned to her and said, hey, are you new? I haven't seen you before, I'd like to get to know you. And just the welcome part of being a welcome. And the, the woman said, I, I got a box at Chick-fil-A and I just, I just have to tell you, I was so loved when I came in and dropped it off. I knew I needed to go to church, and I picked this one because you loved on me. I know you can't come in this building. You can't go in any of Calvary Church's facilities without being loved on. I have, it's been evident to me this morning, first-time visitor, evident to me this morning, from great parking <laughs> to coffee to just being loved, loved and appreciated for who I am. I know you're doing that here. You do it at your drop-off location, people are gonna to come to know Jesus on this side of the box. See, see those, those cardboard boxes go to a central drop-off and you guys are our central drop-off, tractor trailers in the driveway, and they take those cardboard boxes and they put them on there. And do you know the truck drivers told their people they're willing to do extra for OCC, like show up late, show up early, give them a smaller window. These are not important to you, but Bobby Babuka, that's very really exciting for him. Uh, that they're willing to do this because we are so loved on by the people there. They give us gift, like they make us homemade cookies and they hand them to us or they give us coffee or they let us go to the bathroom inside when we're there. <laughs> that we don't have to go to McDonald's, we can go inside the church and, and we feel loved on. Mom, the $9 does that. So then the tractor trailers go to the processing center and I have the joy of being the second shift processing center manager. In Baltimore last year, we processed 820,000 shoeboxes that went to eight different countries. This year, we're slated to do even more because you guys are obedient. Our, our donors are obedient in packing them. We're going to process more. But see, the $9 pays for all that. We have to rent a building. We have to pay people. We have to, lots of things have to be done. So money has to come from somewhere. Your $9 takes care of that. You see, we hire from a hiring agency. People don't have to be Christian. They don't have, in fact, we've had Muslim workers before that come and they are telling everyone about OCC. And I'm like, great, I love it. 
we have little evangelists in the community. <laughs> because they're respected and they're, they're, they're loved on and they're cared for, though they're held to a standard of doing the job. See, we have one job, we call them dock workers, but I call them heavy lifters because all they do is lift heavy things up and put heavy things down. That's all they do. These are rough and tumble, sorry ladies, they are all men because I don't want that job either. Let them lift the heavy things. That's, you know, I'm good with guys lifting heavy things. But they're, they're guys and they're kind of rough around the edges. And most of them have told me they'll never go into church because they don't feel loved and accepted there. Aww. Now, they didn't say that. They said they just don't feel comfortable. But our shipping and receiving manager and our chaplain said, we're going to pray over every container. See, we put 480 cartons into a container and we close it up and we send it to the port of Baltimore. It gets on a boat and it's gone from Baltimore. So our, our, my manager said, we're going to pray. So the, I, I took pictures that year just randomly. And at the end of the season, I realized the first picture was the shipping receiving manager and the chaplain and the guys standing around being respectful. They're just standing around. And then I looked at the last picture of the season. And every one of my heavy lifters, every one of my dock lifts, hands on the cartons, praying for them. They had seen how important it was. Your $9 because of the processing center, they saw how the, the power of prayer. And they participated. That wouldn't happen if that $9 wasn't doing. I said, Mom, that's the exciting things on this side of the shoebox. Then we ship them, and they get all the way, like I said, all the way to the, the other side, which is great. But what's more important, those ministry partner guides that I was showing, in order to receive one, you have to be trained. You have to be trained in sharing the gospel with children age appropriately. How many of you know it's a, there's a difference between sharing with adults and sharing with children? Every mom is going, yes. Every teacher. Any teachers in the house? Yeah. I love you automatically. Right there. Teach, teach, I'm a third generation child of a teacher. So, like, teachers? Ooh, gold star. But you have to learn that it's different in speaking to them and sharing the gospel with them. OCC does that. See, I was in Rwanda, and they said the only children's, get this, only children's discipleship material in their language in the entire country of Rwanda is OCCs. The only way they decipher their children in their language, they have some in French, but in Kenyawandan, the only one is through OCC. You're doing that. Nine dollars is doing that. See, we're training them. Those posters get covered. They have the posters. They have the ministry guide. And then the greatest gift, that little booklet I was telling you about, that's all part of the nine dollars. And so I told my mom, I said, now do you understand? She goes, you got to tell people that. I said, mama, I do that for a living. She goes, no, no, you have to tell everybody. Okay. So we went to senior adult choir because they know the good places to eat. And so I was just waiting for my mom. She goes, tell them. And I'm like, uh, okay. So I told her friends at senior adult choir. Then we went to Sunday school and she said, tell them. I'm like, I don't think they care, but okay. And I told them what the $9 was for. And so if you meet my mom, will you please tell her I told you? <laughs> because um, I don't want to get in trouble. I told her I tell this story now. She's like, oh. she goes, okay, if it's for the gospel, tell them the story. Tell them the story. Tell them how they are impacting children around the world. Because you are. Every time in your obedience, every time you're obedient in packing a shoebox and praying over that shoebox, every time God is using that to open doors overseas. See, I was talking about those unreached people groups. One in every 20 shoeboxes, one in every 20 goes to an unreached people group. We didn't even know Tanzania was reaching their 22. Over 80 people groups were reached last year through OCC. 1,286 churches have been planted because of shoeboxes. Since we became an organization, we started tracking 1,286 because events happen and then churches get started. See, there's a pastor in Tanzania. His name is Pastor Moses. What's his name? I'm glad you're still with me. Good job. <laughs> pastor Moses. See, Pastor Moses had an affluent church. He had a good salary. He was growing his church. He was growing his people. It was doing great. They had a building. They had what they needed. They had a property. And then he was burdened to go through the slum area in Arusha. If you don't have 
land and you come to the city for work, you just put up a little shanty in this area and it's very poverty stricken. And he walked through and he found nine mosques, zero churches. He said, this can't happen. I need to tell those children. So he passed his church off to the associate pastor and he started teaching kids and and he knew that that's the way you reach is through the children and new generation and he told them about Jesus and then when their parents found out it was about Jesus, they couldn't come to his church anymore. And he couldn't do anything because nobody would come to his building. Then he thought, shoeboxes. Parents want their kids to have gifts. Especially in an area where there's not running water and there are not walls on the side of their houses. They'll send their kids to gift. So he found an off-site event and he did that and then he taught the greatest journey, which is the discipleship program and, and people delineate the $9 is for shipping, but if you give six extra dollars, how many of you spent more than six extra dollars stopping at a convenience store or Starbucks on the way here this morning? Uh, don't raise your hand. Six dollars, 12 weeks of discipleship, 50 cents a week. They get a booklet, they, upon graduation, they get a Bible in their language, they get a certificate that say they finished 12 weeks of discipleship, so he did that. And that was year one. Year two, he got 150 more shoeboxes, 150 different kids, did the same thing. So this year, this year he was looking for an out, you know, a place to have his outreach event. And the imams, the imams who are the pastors of the, the mosques, equating with ours, like pastors of churches, imams, mosques, they came to him and said, Pastor, you don't have to look for somewhere this year. We will send our kids to your church. And Pastor Moses said, what has changed between this year and last year? And this is what the imams, the pastors of the Muslim church told him. We have seen the character of the children you teach and we want our children, all of them, to have that character. You are opening doors for sharing the gospel who have been to people who have been resistant and you're changing areas, you're changing villages, you're changing towns, you are making a difference because you're being obedient and packing a shoebox on this side. That go therefore, if you're praying, your prayers are going therefore. You may never step in Tanzania or Rwanda or Ukraine or one of the other 120 countries that we send shoeboxes to, but you're there, you're part of that. You're also part on this side, your local communities, your local people, you're part of that. So here's what I want you to do is, now that I've told you all these stories, they're now your stories, you can tell them however you want to tell them to share how Operation Christmas Child is making a difference around the world, sharing the gospel, they're your years. You guys got that? Now here's what I don't want you to do. I don't want you to walk away from here saying, oh, Connie told some really good stories. That's not why I did that. I want you to walk away challenged. What has God done in your heart that is different than when you walked in the doors when you walk out? How are you changed, not by me, but by how God is working in the lives of kids around the world and in your local community? So here are some challenges you could do. If you've never packed a shoebox, pack a shoebox, right? If you've packed a shoebox, engage somebody else to pack one with you. So then it's exponential growth. The third thing is if you're called to give to the greatest journey, that program, that discipleship program, that extra $6 that's probably in your couch cushions or in your ashtray in your car, $6 sends a kid through that. Feel free to do that. Pray. Pray for Operation Christmas. Pray for those boxes. When you walk by that wall for the next three weeks, just stop and say a prayer over those boxes, those cartons, because those are going overseas. They're not decorations. Pray. This church, Bobby and Pam, would love for you to help it during National Collection Week and collecting and cartonizing and loading them into trailers. More hands lessens the work. Talk to them. They would love to have you involved. If you're interested in joining our area team, talk to them as well. They have all the information. But what I don't want you to walk away was that was, that was entertaining. God has brought you here today. The, the, the word has been read. The, God has been here through our worship. He is with us now. Don't leave the same as you came in. I cannot tell you what a joy it is to stand in front of you. 
to travel here and to see our partnering churches those that, that I get to partner with all over the, the several states, and that my friends and I as regional managers across all of America know from the bottom of my heart there's no way to appreciate your obedience than to tell you, continue doing it. Pastor Moses needs you. Those kids, my little squirrely little boys I sat to, they need you. And there are 10 million others that we can reach this year if we do it together. Let's pray. Father God, thank you. Thank you for these obedient brothers and sisters who sit in front of me. I thank you so much that they have come to hear, not me, but to hear what you were doing, how you were being glorified around the world through a simple gift. There may be some that are sitting here today and say, I don't even know who Jesus is. If they want to respond to that, there are people here that can can share with them and can lead them to you. Father, don't let anyone leave with an unsettled spirit today. Let them settle it today, ask questions, find out how to have that relationship with you. Those of us who know you, Father, challenge us how we can spread the gospel, whether it's through OCC or some, more, some other uh, way, but how do we share the gospel, your good news to those who are hurting and our communities are hurting and they have no hope, and we have that. Let us not hoard that hope, but that we share that with all. Father, I thank you for this church and how they point everyone back to your son, point back to who you are. I ask protection and guidance, especially during National Collection Week, that this place be sanctified, be holy ground. We give you praise and honor, for you are the God of glory and the God of grace. And it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.